Hello everyone and welcome back to Let's Play Guacamelee 2. In the last part, we started our cleanup after reaching the final area of the game, the Temple of the Serpent. And now it's time for us to go do, if you can't tell by the title of the video, everything else the game has for us. Including the ending. And this is also our little celebration for 240 subscribers. Thank you guys again so much. Like, I, I know I say it literally every time we have one of these specials. But when you're a smaller channel like me, even every subscriber counts, and I'm very grateful for each and every one of you sticking around. It, it, it means a lot. Now, the way that we're handling cleanup here is me more or less looking at the map, spotting where the next item is, and jump cutting to it. This is mostly because this cleanup portion of the video on its own, which is the first eight minutes or so, maybe? Uh, and then maybe the first 15, actually. It took up about 40 minutes on its own. The world of Guacamelee isn't the largest, but just due to the placement of some of the quick travel points, and me also looking at my notes in the case uh, should it be needed, that there's a lot to backtrack through. Thankfully, there's not too much of the game left in terms of like how many items I have left to grab. I think I was around 70 plus percent uh, at the end of last part when I started cleanup. So, yeah. With that said, uh, you I could recommend, depending on where the items you're uh, missing are, waiting until you get all of the egg key pieces like we finished off getting the last part. Because the ultimate reward for doing all of those could make getting a lot of the items a lot easier. And also, uh, you might notice this video is over an hour long, which is not how I usually like to do these. Uh, just to make that even a bit shorter than it already is, a lot of the lucha rooms in the final area are going to be sped up. So, I can say maybe 20 seconds-ish at a time, depending on how long they were initially without speeding up. I'm not cutting anything out of the final area, though, uh, just because there's not really much- Well, no, actually, I'm doing a couple jump cuts now, I think, about to save on some time still. Either way, nothing major is being cut out. The largest areas to complete in any given playthrough of Guacamelee 2 are between Los Manglares and the Badlands. Just because they're such large areas and getting from one end of them to the other can take a while on its own. With that, though, we're back here in the prison. Because we got all five of the key pieces by the end of the last part, meaning there is now something we can do down here in the little chicken Illuminati area. Again, I believe they place most of the items here on the top layer of the prison, so you don't need to backtrack all the way down in case you miss something, but in the case you do, uh, that, that's a lot of backtracking. <laughs> and I mean a lot of backtracking. But that, let's go see the head chicken priest guy. The, the special key! It's amazing! Special, special key. key! The chosen one. Let us use it to unlock the important door immediately. Important, important door. door! Another timeline portal. Okay. Not too surprising. Behold, the important door has opened. You will be tested with a great challenge inside. Great, great challenge! If you best this challenge, you'll receive the legendary special message. Special, special message. message! The chosen one. I believe in your ability. I'll be waiting for your triumphant return. Triumphant, triumphant return. return! Okay, guys, seriously, it's starting to get annoying. You can give it a rest. Give it, give a, it rest. a rest! Never mind. With that, welcome to The Crucible. If I were to compare this to something in Guacamelee 1, it would be the original rounds through the tool tree. This is one long, long chicken platforming segment. It's a forgiving one in that, similar to some of the other areas, it's a giant vertical shaft with little branch off paths that you go through to get to the top. So in the case you want to leave and come back later, you can and not lose too much progress in a row. But the process to getting those checkpoints can be tedious. I won't say that this entire thing requires perfection, but it definitely requires you knowing the momentum of the chicken, how far your pollo shot will take you, so on and so forth. 
It doesn't take perfection, but it can be certainly close to it. For most of the rooms, I'm showing one or two tries as it was, and then cutting to my successful attempt because in this room, this place can be aggravating, especially rooms like this with the red instant death ball things. I will say there is one room that is definitively the most annoying, but it's also technically the last room. So I can't be too mad at it. Even with all my jump cutting, uh, I was only here for maybe 20 minutes. So I'd say maybe a complete first run through where you don't know what you're doing might take you 30 to 40. If this was a game where dying sent you all the way back to the start of the area with little to no checkpoints like it would be on something like, this, like the Super Nintendo, not so much. But here as the Guacamelee 2 with the checkpointing that it has, it's just a war of attrition more often than not. Hell, I remember for a fact in my first playthrough, uh, I was stuck in this room for longer than I'd like to admit, whereas I think I get it first try here? Also, the collision on the floor Poyo tile wall things are kind of weird in that you'll bounce off of them unless you Poyo shot into them something at a certain angle, in which case you just kind of stand on them for some reason. You, for this, you really kind of got to mash the dimension swap button. I think only the last third or so of the Crucible is really, like, annoyingly hard. The rest of it is just more or less uh, the equivalent of one of the key challenges. This next room coming up, especially if I'm recalling the order correctly, is the big one. Because it requires a lot of precise movements, timings with swapping your dimensions. This room is what takes me the longest any time I play this game. Suitably so, it is the longest room in the Crucible, because it's the only one that's divided into two separate, technically three separate challenges like this, without a checkpoint between it in any way. And realistically, I probably should have, uh, you may have seen there was a Poyo slide block that I completely ignore here, just because I know I'm at the end, and the final room in this place is kind of a breather because <laughs> it's 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 the only one that's outright a bit of a puzzle because you need to go w across one direction jump back to the other side and then go back across in the opposite direction which is easy to do it's just more or less the thought process of wait oh i see which i, I guess summarizes a lot of the puzzle platforming in guacamelee when it gets more puzzle heavy like this it's you doing it wrong and then you get the oh I see kind of moment. <laughs> Which admittedly is a feeling I love for some reason. I don't know exactly why. I just love it when it happens. And that is the Crucible. We're already at the end of it. It's shorter than the Tool Tree for a fact, but it can be harder. For the love of God, can it be harder? Hello? Hi. I'm a chicken. Hi there, I'm the Holy Hen. What's up? Oh, right, the special message, the special key. The message is... Tell those chickens to take it easy on the gold. That's all. Take it easy, okay? Alrighty. Oh, and Juan? Don't spend so much time looking back. You'll miss what's in front. All right. The world looks different through a mask. Did I just talk to a chicken god? But the ultimate reward for the Crucible is the infinite Poyo shot, replacing the ability to just outright fly from the original Guacamelee for getting all the orbs, at least in... Was that in both or was that just in GT SCE? I think that was in the original as well. We get an infinite Poyo shot. It still takes the exact same amount of stamina, but you can just chain them on and on forever and ever. It also is the easiest way to make one of the achievements work. Uh, there's one where you need to do or juggle a single enemy with like six Poyo shots in a row.
I've never done it. And with that, we've also completed the upgrade chain. With that said, we're not quite done here in the Crucible, because you may have seen it in the intro screen to the area. There was a chest above us. Essentially, the first room is where a lot of the chests we don't have for the prison are. Because, uh, you, you, you probably figured it out by this point. In the case there's a sub-timeline like this, or the one where... the From last part where we had the microtransaction dumb commentary thing. Or the meme one, for that matter. Any uh, sub-timelines counts uh, their chests for the area they're in. So these count as prison chests. And there are a lot here. I want to say at least eight. Also, if you think I'm reading every single one of these lines and editing in me saying it a separate time just for this, uh, you're mad and I'm not doing that. <laughs> that is way too many tracks on Camtasia Studio 8. Which I really should upgrade to 2019, but uh, I'll get to it maybe later this year. Kind of surprising they don't give you like a chicken or a, a costume for all that as well. You just get a lot of gold at a point in the game when, let's be real, when you get here, you're probably going to be mostly upgraded anyway, if not completely upgraded like I am. Either way, let's get that message to the chicken priest. By the holy egg from high above, you have returned. Chosen one, did you receive the special message? Special, special message? message? What? A most puzzling... Take it easy on the gold? Take, Take it, it easy, easy on, on the, gold. the gold! But... So... She noticed the gold! I will tell the others! She, she noticed, noticed the, the gold. gold! And that's the end of the chicken Illuminati. Kind of a weird little plotline thing, but you know what? It was humorous. Plus it gave me really good abilities. There are still three items we haven't gotten here in the prison, two of them in this room, and I actually forget to grab the second one until after I go and grab the last one from right above that one save point just west of the toilet to the Chicken Illuminati. The prison is one of the weirder areas to complete in that it's also right next to Play Bluco as well, which is another area I don't have completion in, which... Admittedly, the only reason I didn't have completion in it the first time around is because I didn't grab certain abilities earlier in the game, because uh, you needed the the chicken walls to be uh, available to be able to grab one chest and not, the other one I just straight up missed like an idiot thankfully it's not hard to get there the first one is one that was even in the first game if I recall correctly so I don't know why or how I missed this just head up here to the top of the church and there it is One thing I am glad, though, is that this game's cleanup definitely feels a lot smoother than something like Castlevania Symphony of the Night, where getting completion in that game is more so completing the map and grabbing any items that are there along the way. Whereas here, it's just outright grabbing the items. If you had to completely fill out the map and make sure everything was, like, crisped edged instead of, like, faded away like it gets when you haven't seen the entirety of a room, uh, that would be very tedious. Uh oh. Come on, you can do it. The infinite Poyo shot, though, is going to make certain puzzle rooms and getting the chests within a complete joke. In fact, I actually could have completely bypassed this one just by Poyo shotting up into where the chest is. I guess it's just that I like these kind of puzzles too much and I didn't want to screw them over. I, with that said, I don't think it completely defeats the puzzles in the game like the chicken fly in the original game did when you got that. Because you're still locked into the Poyo shot's four directional movements and its momentum. So you need to be, be careful when you use it, otherwise you're going to just reset the room and you're, well, yeah, you, you, you can't do stuff in that case. With that said, I do think it's still a very suitable reward if you go for the Crucible as soon as you can. Because if you just save a lot of completion until you get it, it does make grabbing all the items still much easier than it would have otherwise.
The Badlands is easily the area I don't like going through the most, though, because compared to Los Manglares, where it's a lot of just straight pathways, there's a lot of up and down and all around just to get to one location. Also, I completely screw up this puzzle. You're supposed to wall run up, up into that top left block and then head right, but no, I just for some reason decided, you know what, I'm going this way, and it doesn't work. So I just decide, screw the rules, I have wings. For those who were trying to use me as a guide and wanted to find out the real solutions to that, I'm sorry, but I think with the platforming puzzles in this game, the puzzles are usually relatively easy to figure out. With that, though, we now have 100% in the main areas. It's time for us to head over to the DLC area, the Proving Grounds. We briefly entered here, like, in part two or three, and we got we talked to Wei Chivo when we got here. But what this place essentially is, well, you know what? I'll, I'll let the NPCs who are here do their best job of describing it. Because look who's up here at the top. Some old friends. I thought you'd never make it. I have a business to run, you know. Anyways, this is the Proving Grounds. Luchadores have come here since ancient times to compete in the Lucha Arts. The ones who have mastered every challenge got to enter the big old dormant meet Tiempo Chitlin. It's got a time. But those Luchadores are way better than you. I'm sure to watch you mess up. Buena suerte. Ignore him, Juan. He's all shot and no powder. He's got a point, though. It's going to take a lot of work. So if we ace these tests, we get to meet a god? Sounds cool. Let's do it. All right, while well, I talk to the other teachers, what this place essentially is, is Guacamelee 2's version of the Devil's Trials from Infernio in the first Guacamelee. There are 15 trials, three for each of the five branches of upgrades. You can't do the top one of each three until you've completely mastered each branch, uh, each respective branch. So, like, I couldn't do the third one of these ones until I completely upgraded the Crocodile's uh, upgrade line. So, it's best that you wait until the end of the game to do this anyway. But this is another thing where some of these challenges kind of get neutered if you decide to go after the infinite Poyo shot first. For the... You get a reward for getting all of the gold medals, uh, which are gotten usually just by either reaching the end of the third round, beating it within a certain time, or in the case of the very top left one, just beating it in general. And while I am showing off each challenge, I'm not showing off the process of getting the gold because it's essentially just going to be doing what I did, but better. It's kind of like in the first game where I showed off each of the Devil's challenges, then I jump cut until they were all gold ranked. At least I think I got gold ranks on all of them. I actually forget. You also do get an item for getting one gold medal for each, and a, tro a trophy for getting bronze through gold for each. Mmm, I'd like to see what a gold uh, medal won. I look forward to awakening your full potential. Mm -hmm. For getting a gold medal in one of each of the sets, you get a costume of that particular mentor. However, unlike most of the costumes in the game, the ones you get of the mentors, as well as the final reward for the Proving Grounds, actually have outright different stats. Also, I'm speeding up a good amount of the trials just to make sure this video isn't an hour and a half long. I only have one of those on the channel from my memory, and I'd like it to be the only one of those. Uh, as for, you know, I might as well go over all the major costumes of note. Uh, for inputting the Konami code, you do get the shirtless arachnid person one, which is just one with a Spider-Man mask that actually has no bonuses. For the DLC, there's two notable DLCs, the three enemigos and the Proving Grounds here. The Enemigos pack allows you to play as Salvador's minions, Waypeck, Muñeco, and Jaguar. In order, way peck, uh, when you're in the world of the dead, you actually leech life from enemies, but when you're in the living world, you take more damage. Muñeco, his... When you're a chicken, your stamina regen speed is increased, but your human stamina regen is much slower. When you're Jaguar, you take more dam... Or no, you do more damage after a dodge, but you do less damage with any of your grappling moves, and one particular boss fight, you actually take more damage? And as for Proving Grounds here, in the order that we met the Mentors, uh, Danya increases your stamina regen speed, and you get more health orbs, but you take- but you do less damage. Flame Face, uh, the more your hit meter increases, your combo meter, the more your damage increases, but your base damage is lower to compensate. Koskorona is probably one of my favorite ones. Any of your thrown enemies, whatever, whatever enemies you throw an enemy into, 
they become grabbable immediately. It's actually very handy for the final one of her particular trials because that entire one is based around not having any normal attacks. You can only throw enemies. And reaching the end of that one's hard. Ay, caramba, you actually got a gold medal? I hate to say it, but I better stick you around here a while. Someone has to keep the tiny success from going to your head. Rooster Ramirez is probably one of the more situational ones, but it does have a good purpose here in these trials as well. You do more damage in chicken form in that one, but you do less as a human. That is very particularly useful for the very top left one, because the best strategy for that is to use the infinite Poyo shot, and just being able to do more damage means it goes by more quickly. I hate this particular trial, by the way. What you have to do is you swap dimensions back and forth so the green skeleton on the top of the screen doesn't touch the spikes and die. But doing that with the time you're allotted can be kind of t tense at times, especially during the last round. Uh, Way Coco, the crocodile, his costume, your human special moves cost half stamina, but your max health is reduced dramatically. And then there's the final costume we're going to get, but we'll, I'll talk more about that when we get to it. It's probably one of my favorite ones, despite me not like using it, my, liking to use it myself. Because uh, in Guacamelee, I prefer to either just play as Standard Juan or Tostada, or one of the outright cosmetic costumes, if I'm not using one from, like, DLC that... Not one from DLC, rather, one from, like, the, the Steam Workshop, because some of the ones on there are really creative and just generally really cool. My favorite one is the Samus one that someone made, if you can't tell, because it's me. I will say, I think the challenges in this game are much more varied and interesting than the ones in Inferno in the first game. Though, given how this area works, I can't help but wonder, was this always meant to be DLC, or was it meant to be included, and they just couldn't get it in in time? The, the Drusa Ramirez challenge sets arguably the easiest. Uh, I do surprisingly get a lot of gold medals just on my first ramp branch through. I think I only don't get four of them, and I had to go back for them. The process of getting all the gold medals probably will take you between a half hour to an hour, depending on how good you are at the various abilities and just puzzle platforming in general. My disciple, you won a gold medal. How precious. You aren't used to the taste, but you'll suit hunger for the grains of glory. Perhaps I'll leave a few, few for you to peck. <laughs> Rooster Ramirez's costume is one of my favorites. Just in luck, because look at that. <laughs> you do just properly turn into Rooster Ramirez when you go into your chicken form, but I, I, I love that design so much. It's so incredibly stupid. Also, now that I think about it, is this the first, like, proper DLC I've ever done on the channel? It very well might be. Huh. Uh, my general thoughts on DLC, it's, it can be good, it can be bad, it depends on what it is, who's doing it, so on and so forth. For games, for indie games like this, I don't mind if they're this very tiny, just kind of side stuff that you get some cool rewards for, but it doesn't matter in the long run for the game. But at the same time, I also appreciate the effort those bigger DLCs go out there for. Like, uh, for those of you who have played The Messenger, the free update they did for the game that added that whole new side area thing, that was relatively extensive for that game's scale, and I really admired it for that. But not every indie developer can do that. It's usually in AAA games where DLC and me kind of tend to not mix so well. Nintendo games less so, because usually their DLC is either more or less pointless in it, which is kind of a surprising balance. The, I think the most recent DLC stuff I got, let me think about this. Beyond this, I have the first of the PS4 Spider-Man DLCs. I didn't get any of the future ones yet, just because I haven't played it yet. Uh, do I count the later Shovel Knight campaigns if you bought the game early enough? I mean, because I have the PS4 version, I got that from the start, and technically speaking... Plague of Shadow, uh, Plague of Shadows Onward are DLC once you, after they're all released, but, hmm, I don't know how to consider that one, but each of those are re really, really extensive, so they're almost just outright different games at that point, really. Uh, Smash DLC, I guess, because I like Smash Brothers. Byleth was really cool, I liked the character a lot. Fire Emblem Three Houses in general was just really cool, I like that game a lot. <laughs> Golden Deer, man, it, it's... Fear the deer. <laughs> Black eagles are cool too, I suppose. I have problems with some of their characters because Ferdinand and Sylvain are probably the most generic characters in the game, even though they have some really good backstories to themselves all the same. 
I didn't care for the blue lines myself too much, but that's just my preferences. I still have to get the DLC for that game now that I think about it, because Ash and Shadows, whatever it was called, looked really cool. Huh. Eh, I'll get to it. Poyo Shot kind of makes some of the timer-based challenges redundant in a way, because you can just skip a lot of the actual challenge. It's another just nice little reward for going after the Poyo Shot before anything else, really. See, Luchador, training hard gets you the gold. Don't stop now. Sword today is strong tomorrow. I am at least glad, though, that both the DLCs for this game weren't just, okay, here, here's some costumes. I'm glad you have to work for these ones because it makes them feel all the more worth it. With that said, though, this is easily the hardest challenge out of this set for me because you have to take out the Mega Exploder. There's a good reason this room is this big. Yikes! What they want you to do is just hook all over the place and use the stamina recharges to get new moves and all that. But the best way to take care of this is to have the infinite Poyo shot and use the Rooster Ramirez skin. Because that way you'll just be boosting all over the place. You can use the stamina refills to make sure you don't run out of stamina and take out the other exploders before you die. So I heard you like space invaders. This got a good chuckle out of me when I first got here. It's not a very hard challenge, though the timing can be not strict, but tense. Because like in actual Space Invaders, the every time they reverse direction, they lower themselves down, I want to say, one level. So you need to make sure you're at least taking out a row every second or a couple. Well, not every second, but like every couple seconds. Also notable, I think each of the DLC skins have different sound effects for like their voice clips. All right, Juan, you got a gold medal. Watching you master these moves is too awesome. Makes me want to land a spiral choke slam on Salvador myself. With that, though, we are getting towards the end of the actual DLC. Like I said, it's nothing too substantial, but I guess relative to the game's length, it, it, it feels right. Plus, the, the Inferno challenges, despite me not liking a lot of them, were a very famous part of the first game just because getting... The last mask piece or the gold medals was apparently one of the more infamous parts of the game if it wasn't, you know, the whole memes thing. <laughs> so I guess I can't blame them for thinking this was the best idea for DLC, and it is still fun. I will I must say that again, it is still fun. It just feels I guess the word I'm looking for is a little underwhelming. With that said, I do love supporting indie developers, so I would happily still buy more of this stuff. <laughs> Because indie developers, uh, this is a weird time to get into this, I suppose, but I really do feel like indie developers are some of the most original people in game design today. Yeah, they have a lot of inspirations based off other games like this, and many others take inspiration from Metroid, so on and so forth. But they take those concepts and work with them in much better ways, or they just use it as a baseline and then build up from there. For instance, uh, one I played recently that I really liked was Iconoclasts. I think it does a similar thing to a lot of the other Metroid-inspired games, where... Despite being inspired by Metroid, it's more linear than anything. It just has the map system and items you can go out of your way to grab that's not entirely necessary. But I still like the game a lot because I found the combat fun and the story begets its graphical style because, uh... Oh, damn, that game was dark. And now it's time for me to jump cut away for all the gold medals. Juan, you've proven your mastery of the lucha arts. Including grappling, which is the toughest one. Holy giblets! I can't believe you actually did it! The door's opening! Mmm, ha, you have proven yourself worthy to be um, in the presence of gods! Mm. Most importantly, you're worthy to be in my presence as well. From now on, you may look me in the eye, my disciple. We couldn't have done it without you, trainers. This is it, Juan. Are you ready to meet a god? Yeah, I guess. Let me actually swipe back to Juan first. Way to go, Juan. I can hear your muscles crying from here. You really turned my hump day into a pump day. I'd like to note, it was not Wednesday when I recorded this, so that's not a timer-specific dialogue. And here's me just showing off the costumes. And if we look here, right next to Way Coco, there's one more. Hmm. I wonder what that could be. Whoa. Optical illusion, tetrahedron things, cool. 
Is that a giant nacho and giant guacamole? All oh, right, but he meaning him. That is a very detailed hand. Uh, Senor Tiempo Chitle? <sighs> Who dares interrupt Ultramundo? Who dares interrupt, interrupt my sacred siesta? Oh, mighty lord, I am Tostada, guardian of the mask. This is my friend Juan from... <sighs> Ahem. <sighs> what? What do you want? Salvador has stolen the ancient relics. We desperately need to beat him. If I grant you what you seek, do you promise to leave? Of course, my lord. Good. I don't know why you would want to be Salvador, but here you go. Wait, this isn't... Ah. Uh, great. Thanks. So, our ultimate reward for the Proving Grounds is one last costume, Salvador. Extraordinarily high damage, but you're extraordinarily slow with your stamina regen. Essentially, you're just using your brawling moves, less so than your actual special moves, barring shields. It's a cool costume, but again, I prefer to play in the vanilla costumes. And that's the Proving Grounds, done in like 15 minutes. I guess it took me closer to an hour off screen, but eh, you know what I mean. With that, the only area we don't have 100% in, even in the map, is the final area, the Temple of the Serpent. So it's about time we head over there. Oh, first I should probably talk to Wei Chivo. You did it, Juan. I'm proud to call myself your mentor. By the way, how's your mother? Oh, you silly little shit. With that... Now let's finally go ahead and off and finish the game. The Temple of the Serpents, I think, is a drastic improvement over the... I can't even remember the name of the final area from the first game, but it's a good improvement over it. Because in the first game, the final area was more or less just a bunch of combat rooms in a row over and over and over again with a couple of little platforming challenges, but nothing of real note. This is a much better split between combat and platforming. I downright, I, I dare say there might actually be more platforming than combat. That is, if you ignore the enemies, you can't ignore. Because there's like three to five rooms where there's just a lot of enemies in a row. With no need to beat them, you can just ignore them and you're fine. And I do that for most of them because at this point, I'm looking at my recording timer going, okay... If I want to make this in less than an hour and a half, I need to get through this quickly. Because my general mentality with the videos on the channel is... The celebratory ones are the ones that should be the longest, no doubt, because we're celebrating something. And I like them generally to be around an hour, but if they have to be between an hour and an hour and a half... Because of what's left in the game, or I don't want to extend it for another part, sure, whatever. But for my main videos, I like them to be between 15 to 25 at the most, because I feel like, unless it's just videos people have on in the background, which if you guys are doing that right now, hello, I hope you're enjoying your work. Uh, I feel like that's just the best time length where people are willing to give, okay, I can take this time out of my schedule to watch this one video or so. Hour longs, I feel people either are... Like, on their weekends watching, or, again, just doing it while uh, listening to them when they have work in the background. That's why I tend to have most of my videos not be an hour long. <laughs> Unless it's, like, the finale of a long RPG like uh, Final Fantasy VII, which wrapped up last month. Uh, the, the finale of that was 45 minutes, I think? And for RPGs, I'm a bit more willing to go for longer parts, just because they're longer games. And I try to be between 25 to 35 at most, barring a lot of plot elements and how much my notes takes me through at a single point in time, which might be too much, it might be too little, who knows half the time. The Temple of the Serpent's main gimmick has yet to show itself, though, so we'll talk more about that when we get there. And most of the chests here are found, actually, by backtracking. Uh, like with many of the game's areas at this point, as you may figure it out by now, 
the way the Temple of the Serpent is structured is that it's one long vertical shaft with a lot of spin-off branches. The spin-off branches are how you actually progress. The long shaft can only be traversed top to bottom. God, that's a bad way to phrase that. Uh, by completing the area. It's essentially your shortcut way. And, like, three or four of, like, the eight or nine chests in the area are found just in that little section. So it becomes a lot of just backtracking to get there. What I could recommend, I suppose, is waiting until you're finished with the area and then backtrack through it to grab all the chests, but... Eh. Also, I will be taking advantage of the infinite Poyo shot again throughout this entire area just to skip some platforming challenges and get through it a bit more quickly. I imagine it's what speedrunners do, too, now that I think about it. I will say definitively, though, this is the better final area between it and Guacamelee 1. Just because it's much more varied and interesting with its platforming while also still having some solid enough combat challenges. Also, I love the background here. For the most part, I know I said that Guacamelee 2 does a better job of visually distinctifying its areas, and I think it does, but most of that comes from the background just being much more visually distinct. In the first game, it was mostly just a lot of solid colors and kind of hazy backgrounds, whereas here, there's like actual geometry and such in the background. And while I prefer that, I hope if we ever get a third game, and I know I've said that a couple times, that we just go straight up, like, completely unique area looks. If that's even possible with the engine they use. I actually don't know what engine they use. A lot of the air, the platforming in this area isn't hard, and it's made even easier by the infinite Poyo shot, which is why I don't feel too guilty by spamming it all over the place to get through the platforming stuff. If this were, say... Well, no, not even then, because people love skipping over hard stuff if they find a way to cheese through. I'm looking at the Cape Feather in particular for the end game of Mario World, which, now that I think about it, can be applied similarly, because you... I, I think there's a way for you to fly infinitely? I don't know. Uh, here's the main gimmick of the Temple of the Serpent. Serpents. <laughs> they act... The closest comparison I can make is they act a bit like the snakes in that one stage of Battletoads. Where they're constantly following a certain pathway and you need to use them as platforms to jump up, climb up, so on and so forth until you reach the end. Notable though, the heads and the tails, they look like spikes for a reason. Because they are. If you place yourself incorrectly, you're going to be taking some damage, and that's no good. Also, I don't know why. I was very compelled to just hold the jump button when I was wall climbing here for some reason, even though that will just more often than not make you jump off. And I think I know exactly what's doing that. Uh, you see, the Mega Man Zero ZX Legacy Collection just came out, and I'm adapting to using the R button for my sub weapons like I did in my old ZX LP, not even old, like my ZX LP a while back now. And doing that for the classic Zero games is throwing my mind off and making me hold buttons when I shouldn't. Zero, Zero Legacy Collection is pretty well put together, though. All the galleries there, all the music's available. It's nice. It's what I'm going to use to record ZX Advent when I get to there, just because I can do the animated cutscenes and voice acting and, you know, not AM radio being played through an AM radio being played through an AM radio quality. <laughs> Man, having the animated sequences in full, like, HD is nice, too. This is one of the rooms where I was talking about earlier, though, where it's just a room with a lot of enemies in it that you don't need to fight. You're encouraged to because, hey, look at all my money that I'm never going to use now. But there's really no reason to. It's not like it changes any dialogue either. Oh, hi there, you're big. This thing is basically just a moving bit of red spikes, if you can't tell by its very red teeth. We just need to outrun it and not fail like I did there. There's a couple of these segments in this uh, dungeon, maybe three or four. None of them are that hard. <laughs> well, I guess the last one could cause some problems depending on how uh, dexterous your fingers are. But... Nothing too bad. Oh, and this is probably the worst, worst, worst combat section in the game. They make it look like you just have to get to that one Alux in the bottom right to end this. But no, every single one of the action blocks contains between three or four different enemies you need to take out. And you can be here for 
a while because of it. It may be just because of the break between episodes that is very standard for these LPs, but I swear to God the enemies get more aggressive towards endgame. It's either that or because of the amount of enemies they put right next to each other. It just feels that way. Ah! Also, we want to come down here because there are two chests linked in the shortcut back up. I will be jump cutting back to the top, though, just because... Yeah. There's there's something very off about the scaling of this room to me, though. And it's only really noticeable by how fast you ascend vertically. You feel very sluggish in this room, partially due to the scale. And partially because I swear they make it so you move a little bit slower here. It's either that or the frame rate's just tro dropping enough that that's possibly a thing. Oh, hey, Dolmec. Luchador, it's about time. My brothers won't shut up about you. If any of them knew the real secret green and sacred guacamole, they'd probably be trying to conquer the Mexiverse instead of that jerk Salvador. Also, the only thing tougher than muscle is stone, so let's be thankful they're a bunch of stationary wannabes. Anyways, it's sacred salt. Ready for a trip? Nope. I just realized I forgot to show the, the Olmec back at the prison. Uh, whoops. Well, I showed off that he's there, but I didn't show off his dialogue. Ah, well. Ah, it's more food jokes, more or less. I, I do like that build up to just that anticlimactic of a punchline, though. It, 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 it's funny because it's unfunny, if that makes sense. That's one thing I'm very glad about the Guacamelee games, is that, yeah, while well, sometimes the memes can be a bit much in the first one, the actual writing is really good when it decides to actually write and not just be gameplay with no storyline. Which is my biggest problem with the first game in specific. There's a lot of sections where you're just kind of moving forward with not much dialogue. The second game here really did improve that. Because there's a lot more scenes along the way. And I'm just happy about that. And I know... Actually, now that I think about it. I know they joked with the whole RPG section. Uh, which used some assets from Guacamelee 1. That was probably like part three or four now, I forget the exact part that was in. That uh, that little alternate timeline was very RPG-like. But I have to wonder, if Guacamelee could legitimately work as like a Paper Mario type of timing-based RPG, because it's got the right idea of look down, and it has the writing to be that generally kind of light-hearted, humorous RPG. I'm wondering if they could pull that off and make it work. I doubt they'll ever do it, but I feel like that could be an interesting idea to pull off with. I mean, hell, you already got three of the four play uh, uh, three of the four main party members you would probably have right there: uh, Juan, Tostada, and Weichivo. Maybe Satabe for a fourth. Maybe have uh, alternating party system. You can bring in like Jaguar Javier. Uh, I guess Muñeco. <laughs> I don't know. Flame face definitely. I feel like if they ever want to expand Guacamelee into more stuff, they could easily do it. Because it's just such an approachable concept, aesthetic, and franchise that they could do it well, I feel like, in any gameplay style. But I feel like they're also just trying to keep it straight, uh, yeah, keep it right onto the Metroid-like stuff. And you know what? I applaud them for that. That does remind me, though. Uh... Between this part and the last part, they apparently, the developers apparently put up an update, like, not like an update to the game, but like a social media update, talking about their 2019, and apparently Juan made a lot of cameos in games throughout last year that I just wasn't aware of, and I'm very glad because this is a character in game I like having uh, some love thrown at it. Like, I think Indivisible Juan was like an optional character or something, I still haven't played that game. I'm looking at my PS4 copy right now across the way behind my copy of Death Stranding that I still need to finish. Norman Reedus in his Fantastical Fetus is a very odd game. It's interesting. Just not much to it. Gameplay-wise, at least. Now, one thing I can't quite tell if it's just the game structure going against the level design or just the pacing of the game itself and me having to record it in these very separate episodes is I feel like this final area might drag on maybe one branch of path too long 
But I can't tell if that's just because it's all kind of blending together in my head. The various lengths of the areas. Because the more I think about it, the more I realize a lot of the areas are just about the same length. It's just what you do in them. That makes it feel shorter or longer, I guess. I don't know. I like this section though. This is a this this is a cool little fighting section. We have a bit of an alternative timer. The ceiling's starting to collapse on us. Uh, I think this is like three or four different combat sections in a row. The chicken's very good for this as long as you don't poyo shot yourselves into the death spikes, which I may have done on my first playthrough. Just be careful. God, that is a lot of money. I know I brought up earlier that Guacamelee 2 does better with its money in that you get to use it more throughout the game and there's just more to throw your money at because of how many upgrades there are and how much they cost. And while that is true, by the end of the game, especially if you already have your upgrades maxed by the time you even reach this final dungeon, you're still gonna be nearly maxing out your money. Or not maxing out, but getting more than you're ever gonna need to do with. It makes me wish there was still something you could put it towards, like maybe... Say you, there was an orphanage you could spend money on to repair it or something like that, or... <laughs> maybe, maybe go all Wario Land and make it so that the amount of money you have at the end of the game determines part of the ending. Not like part of the story stuff, but maybe like, you can build a golden statue of something, <laughs> and it'll show up in your next playthrough, or... Something stupidly cosmetic that could lead to a good laugh. It would be very in tone with the writing, at least. Don't need to fight you, so there's no point in doing so. The Serpents make overall for a very solid platforming gimmick. It's just that the Poyo shot is faster and I really want to make sure this video doesn't go on too long. I say 47 minutes in. <laughs> I will say though... I in terms of final dungeons, I think, despite this one being designed better, that the temple in the first game was a more climactic finale. Prior to the final encounter stuff, the final encounter stuff here, I think, is better. But the dungeon itself, in terms of, like, tone, it definitely had more of a finale feel in the first game. Mind you, that could also cont contradict something I said yesterday because this has been recorded over the course of two days. Because, uh... I got a lot of time to do stuff, don't get me wrong, but I'm still a high, uh, a high school, no, god, no. College student. And... Dedicating more than an hour at a time to something means it's gotta be something either I really like or homework. <laughs> almost there, though. Almost there. Just like we're almost there to so much in gaming right now. 19 days on my end until Doom Eternal, probably 17 or so for you. Uh, just over a month until... No, actually exactly a month, in well, 30 days at least, until Persona 5 Royale, the Final Fantasy VII Remake, and Resident Evil 3 Remake next month. April and M March are just going to drain the everlasting hell out of my wallet. <laughs> and you know what? I am here for every second of it. And this is our last standard combat section. I gotta say, it's probably one of the cooler ones because they throw a lot at you and I really like the background, but it's... It's still the combat. It kind of makes me wish some of the areas had, like, unique stipulations for your combat. Like, maybe... Uh, one place your aerial moves are slower, or... You had a chance of... I don't know. Yeah, actually, you know what could have made for an interesting uh, area in a Guacamelee game? A place where you're automatically switching between human and chicken mid-combo because of some, like, deity who's just snapping his fingers and go, Ha-ha, now you're a chicken. Ha-ha, now you're a person. Ha-ha, now you're a chicken person. Oh, God. I don't know. Something to vary it up a little bit because I think I brought it up a couple times already. Just It's kind of hard to remember because of the length of time between episodes for this particular series. The variation, like the, the actual loop you do in this game is good, but the variation in that gameplay loop is very 
minimal. Yeah, you get more combo moves as you go through and more moves to traverse with, but that doesn't do anything to, like, enhance what you do throughout the game. It's just getting more and more. In the good way, I will say, though, because some games get more and more and it's a bad thing. I'm looking in particular at certain RPGs that just don't know when to end. Or certain anime that do the exact same thing. I'm looking at you, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, because I'm watching that with my friend right now. We're 130 so odd episodes deep. I love season 3, by the way. Uh... And, yeah, the, despite me liking Season 2 a lot, the, the, the Society of Light did not know when to end, <laughs> I feel. It, got, it went on about maybe 10 episodes longer than it should have. Season 3, despite its problems, has been infinitely more interesting. Alright, now there's an optional thing to the left, but I want to head over here first, just so I can get rid of the shortcut and head up to the final area afterwards. Alright, now something I swear they want you to do based off this constant zoom in and us taking out enemies is wall, or wall fly from here. Uh, into here rather, but I actually don't think that's possible. I think they just want you to spam the dash punch over and over again, which, you know what? I'm cool with. I think there is an achievement slash trophy for getting a, a, uh, a hit count of 999. And this is the best section of the game to do it because they just want you to combo the ever-living shit out of these skeletons. It is cathartic, I will admit. <laughs> and look, we even get to become demon, giant demon chicken. This thing is honestly kind of terrifying looking and I can't expect the place why. I think it's the black eye with the yellow pupil. Yeah, that, that, that chicken's seen things. I tend to look at this mostly as a victory lap because you're at the end of the final dungeon. They're just throwing every enemy they can at you in a way where the enemies do not have a chance in any kind of hell. <laughs> but you know what? I like it. I like Catharsis. It's fun. It's like giving you a, uh, a Starman in Mario in front of a chain of like 20 enemies. They just want you to go off and have fun. <laughs> and you know what? I thank them for that, because I am hella happy, though, damn, this is tanking the frame rate. God, that is a lot of money. <laughs> we gained, like, 30,000 across that. Good God. Why, thank you, Echivos. <laughs> I don't know why. I really love that combo count. It's one that I think... If you can reach 999, I'm not sure if it happens anywhere else, but there. Alright, now there's supposed to be a giant puzzle for you to be able to get this. I'm just gonna Poyo Shot up to it. <laughs> Infinite Poyo Shot. It breaks some of the puzzles. Uh, that is an honest-to-god hard puzzle room, and I'm glad I don't have to do it. If you want to figure out how to do it, there's videos on YouTube. With that, though, we are at the game's final checkpoint. So, from beyond here is Endgame. Make sure you got everything you want to do done. What do you mean a dance? The ceremonial dance. You don't have to do it. I said it's optional for you. Well, just hurry up with it. <coughs> that granny whore shot off from earlier must have dried out my throat. Here we go! There! It should open any moment now! See? It worked! Toodles! What? You again? Go home! Oh shit. See ya! Ah, uh, well, we're home, oh, my god. Mama, I don't think the black stuff is slowing down. Juanito, stop staring at it. 
Maybe I carry the two, one, nine. Yes, I got it. What was that? Ow, Papa. Juan, I'm so relieved to see you. We weren't sure what had happened. The voids have almost eaten the house. You have to go back and stop this. I think Wei Chiva was making use of instability to make between timelines to create portals. I've been trying to figure it out. This might be the right equation. I'll just give this a try. Abracadabra? Yes, I... Oh, no, it's shrunk. I can make this work. Cool! Oh, I don't like that. I'm sorry that the fate of the world is on your shoulders again, Cielito. But I know you can do this. We love you very much. So, come home soon, okay? We'll be here waiting for you. Well, I guess I could get used to that. The chicken thing or the warping between dimensions thing? That is a very important line to draw there. <laughs> Jeez, I didn't picture the apocalypse to have this much downtime. What's that smell? What the? How did you get back here? All right, way peck round two. Die. My beautiful new body. Well, I was just stalling you anyway. Hey, don't ignore me. I'm talking to you. All right, what do you have to say? <sighs> I guess this is my life now. Well... It's been a long ride, but we finally made it to El Ultramundo. Let's hope we can reach Salvador before he can get that guacamole. Which is probably the most serious way I've ever said the word guacamole, now that I think about it. <coughs> finally, the sacred guacamole! <coughs> I have given everything for this. Now you will witness how strong a luchador can really be. <coughs> it's just some saliva getting caught in anticipation of this moment. My body will finally be able to sustain my full power. I feel it. The power. The godly powers. And the cilantro and lime too. Very tasty. <laughs> My breathing. It's clear again. Come on, Juan. You wanna go? All right. Salvador time at last. If you want to be the luchador, you have to beat the luchador. Phase one isn't against... Salvador himself, but rather these two serpents he summons. One of them is constantly going to be digging its head into the ground and popping up the three various thirds of the screen, while the other one's firing a laser that'll comb the arena in a couple different ways. They can also just outright fire little fireballs that will cause the residual fire stuff that you don't want to touch because residual damage. When you kill one, the other one does adopt a different attack pattern, and it's completely set... Uh, rather... Whichever one you kill second or first, the pattern that the latter two share, it, the latter one shares, is completely the same. It just gets more aggressive, grows red, moves three times faster. I'm joking about that last part. It starts charging up some lasers to fire at various altitudes. There's also now meteorites falling from the sky that will leave fire, which seems like it would be annoying. But they seldom drop right beneath the serpents, if ever. So if you just stand right beneath its jaw... 
you're completely fine from that. Well, aside from that. <laughs> uh, watch out for where it's aiming its laser, because otherwise you're going to take that hit, because it's a purple and white one, which you just cannot dodge. The serpents aren't too hard, honestly. They can take a while, because sometimes you just... They have periods like this where you can't damage them, but they're not hard. I'm the best there is, Juan. Pasado, presente y fortero. You've gotten better. But you're still nowhere close. Now bear witness to my final form. You can't stop me. You can't even hope to hurt me. I have developed a shield that no man can break. Come and fight me. Don't be a chicken! Oh, 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 Salvador, you're not my dad, shut up. I do what I want. What? How did you break my perfect defense? Well, no matter. I've prepared another perfect defense you will not so easily come overcome. I will crush you, you little bird. Nah. Alright, that's it for the dialogue. Salvador! The best way I can comprise him is he's you. If you were also Jaguar Javier, he is very aggressive with his attacks. He'll switch his dimension and his shields every now and then just to keep you on your toes and make sure you use as much stamina as possible. The only attack he has that's not really a wrestling move that's essentially what you fight with is when he goes up into the air slightly and digs his three dragon heads into the ground. The dragon heads themselves are the only part of that attack, though, from my knowledge, at least here on easy mode. Also, he also has the shoulder tackle, of course. But they don't electrify the ground or anything, so you can just stand slightly to the left or right and you're fine. He's got a lot of health, though, and he doesn't even have any of the usual phase barriers that a lot of the other bosses have had. He's intense, and if you're not careful, he can deal the damage quickly. But if you've gotten this far, you're going to be able to handle Salvador no problem, really. Unless you're on hard mode again, which I hear is much harder. <laughs> I have never played hard mode, I don't intend to anytime soon because I think the game's difficulty is... Well, it's on the easy side, good enough as it is. begged me to give up the mask. But how could I? It was a part of me. I saved them. I saved them! <coughs> it's just the unfamiliar tastes of defeats. The end, Salvador. Hey, um... Remember when I said we'd be together until the end of the world? I didn't quite mean it this literally. Oh, Chivo, that was ages ago. Pecky. Your bone structure still is radiant as the day I met you. Oh, please. Aren't you from the good timeline? I'm not even your way, Peck. <sighs> Whatever happened to... us? You, you were too busy. Me? You were obsessed with Lucha. Oh, come on, blame it on me again. You're so stubborn. I swore that I would never fall in... Why are you such a dweeb?
He, he did it. The voids are gone. What happened? Oh. No. Poor Salvador. We did it, Juan. We saved the Mexiverse. Now, let's get you back to your family. Sure thing. I'll create a portal for you now. Cabra Cadabra, one portal coming up. Ah, my staff must be frozen. Let me try turning it off and on back on again, just a sec. You restored the relics. Timeline travel is impossible now. He's stuck. She's right. I'm sorry, Juan. Wait, so Juan will be stuck in this timeline forever? Inside El Ultramundo, you can access, you can access any, any timeline, time but I bet it's a crazy maze in there. there. Technically, though, El Ultramundo, El Ultramundo ties, ties all the timelines together. together. All, all the timelines together. together. All, all the timelines time together. together. Don't spend so much time looking back. You'll miss what's in front. The world looks different through a mask. Take the mask off, Juan! If you want to go home, you need to see clearly. Look, the portal's collapsing! Juan, no! Don't go back in, you'll get lost forever! Oh, damn, I'm not from this timeline either! Guacamelee 2. Uh, also, it occurs to me, they never learn that Tuan gets back safe, so they're spent, the the, the, other, the bad timeline folks spend the rest of their lifetime think, wondering if we died or not. Huh, that's, uh, that's a little grim. Uh, uh, notable, that was the good ending. You get the good ending, as you could tell, based off the fact she appeared. The Holy Hen saying, or going to the Holy Hen at the Crucible and getting the infinite Poyo shot, essentially. Uh, the bad ending isn't exactly a bad ending, it's more of a bittersweet one. 
because when you get into El Tremundo, Juan doesn't take his mask off and spends years wandering timeline to timeline to try and find his home. And he does eventually get there, he just misses a few years in the process. Guacamelee 2 overall, though, is the better game between it and Guacamelee 1. Its writing is more solid, its gameplay is more well refined, its stage design is better, its abilities are more useful. It still falls a bit short in some other areas of my own expectations of what I hear when I hear the word Metroidvania because it's very linear. And not to say that linear Metroidvanias can't work, I'm looking at, uh, not Zero Mission, uh, Fusion especially. But I just prefer my Metroidvanias to be like Fusion or Zero Mission especially. The combat's still solid, the music's great, it's still overall a great game. If you want to play it, it's on more or less all modern consoles, PC, Xbox One, PS4. Uh, there's a physical version that they two-pack of this in Guacamelee 1 for the Switch. It's solid. I recommend it. Honestly, Drinkbox Studios is one of those that I constantly have my eyes on because even though I, there's like one or two of their games I still haven't played, what I have played has impressed me so much that I constantly just want to keep my eyes on them to see what they're going to do next. It's kind of like way forward in a way. Because uh, I'm always just looking forward to whatever these guys are going to do. And I'd like to thank you guys for sticking around this LP and for 240 subscribers once again. This has been a long LP to get done. Like, I think a year and a half total for this one. And I've enjoyed every moment of it. And thank you all again for joining me on every journey I do. With that said, I think I'm never going to do a Metroidvania for a celebratory series again. Because not only do we get lost in the maps... I can't tell if I bring up something I've already brought up before or not, and that's not good for uh, LP sake, I think. And something else you're going to be able to do once this credit sequence ends. In fact, you'll make me, you'll see me try and skip this because I think that this ending part of the music goes on just a bit too long. Is that they bring up your percentage ranking and your end game time. Which they then used to calculate you on the leaderboards. Uh, there are four categories. Speed run, speed run 100%, and then hard mode for both of those. Both times, I've been in the low 100s uh, for my ranking. Because I've gotten 100% each time. Thank you guys for watching. Have a great night, and take care. And I'll see you guys next Let's Play, whatever that may be. Thank you again for 240 subscribers. And I'll see you guys then.